and with one another and just the opportunity to worship you, Lord, and to now come into your word and to hear what you have to say to us. And Lord, we, we step into an area of your scripture, Lord, this morning that just garners so much controversy and misunderstanding. And Lord, I'm just praying for clarity by your spirit that I would speak only what you intend for me to speak and it would be truth. And Lord, we just pray against any hindrance of our enemy here, Lord, this morning that would come against this or bring any kind of confusion, Lord, because we know that's not of you. So Lord, we turn this time and this word of yours over to you. And Lord, we just yield to your spirit's workings as we sit before you and just ask you that you would teach us. And we ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we find ourselves back in Romans, by the way, in chapter 13, at least the opening parts of chapter 13. But I want you to do a little work with me here so that you can follow along. Before you go to Romans 13, I want you to find Ephesians chapter 5. Find Ephesians chapter 5. And when you find Ephesians chapter 5, put a finger there and then, actually I did that backwards. (laughs) I wanted you to find Romans 13 and then go to Ephesians 5, however you want to do that, because we're going to start with Ephesians 5. So find both of them and mark Romans for yourself so you can turn back to that. I said it was instructions, but I didn't say it would be clear. So you want to mark Romans and be in Ephesians 5. Hopefully the rest of this is a lot clearer than those instructions. I want to read us beginning in verse 22 of Ephesians 5. I want to read us through the end of that chapter and then into chapter 6. And I just pray that you're very discerning of what the Lord is showing us in these verses. And it's going to be easy to look at things that's not what he's showing us. And so let's read through it and then we'll discuss it. Beginning in Ephesians 5, 22. There it says, Paul writing, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, and also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Listen particularly to this verse, verse 32. This is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing his will, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a, is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. 
Now, you don't need to turn to this, but I'm going to read one more verse. And it's from Hebrews chapter 13, and it's verse 17. And I dare say it's probably an unfamiliar verse to, to many. In Hebrews 13, verse 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. That verse there is speaking about spiritual leaders in the church, your elders, pastors, and stuff like that, who keep watch over you. And in case you didn't know, your leaders in the church, the scripture says, will have to give an account for what they did with the body. And so there's a huge charge there. Now, what did we just see in that part of chapter 5, in that part of chapter 6, in that one verse from Hebrews 13? We saw that God is a God of order. That was the importance of reading through that, because I think that's one of the greatest examples that Jesus gave us in his word, that he is at the head of all things, and under him he has set all things and in order that is both pleasing to him and purposeful, in that it will fulfill his plans and purposes if it is adhered to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 30, 33, it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And you could read that as he's not the author of disorder, but order. And so that's really the focus this morning as we go into what is, as I prayed earlier, a very controversial chapter of the Bible. Some very controversial verses that begin chapter 13 of Romans. And by the way, you can turn back there. The misunderstanding and the misapplication of these verses has cost the church greatly, not only over time in general, but in particular the last three and a half years. The misapplication and the misinterpretation has weakened the church. The church had already, in a great sense, through its neglect of many of its obligations, subtracted itself from society, from the public square, from the ways it was meant to influence the society through the public square and many other institutions. And then in the last three and a half years, because of the misapplication and the misunderstanding, the church reduced itself even further. And I think it was, if I could use the word, spiritually criminal, what took place. And so we want to make sure that we understand what these verses are actually telling us as believers, actually telling us at the church, as a church. And there's no doubt in my mind that someone listening this morning, whether here or later on video, is going to disagree with me. And I know that because I had people here that when we decided that, no, we're going to carry on as the church and not as government dictated, that I was approached and asked, shouldn't, shouldn't we be the ones to set the example? And I said, of what? Compromise? Of what? Not living out God's word? And so we want to make sure that we understand from Scripture, not from me, but from Scripture, what our conduct should be. So let's read that first verse. It says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and authorities that exist are appointed by God. That's the New King James. I want to read it also from the King James Version because of the different wording. In the King James, it says, Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Every time I use that first verse, I'm going to read it in both manners because I think it's important that we see the usage of the, di of the li different language. So first thing, everything and everyone is subject to the higher power. And who is that? That is God, our creator. And it's been that way since the beginning. Adam was told to subdue the earth and have dominion. He was to have perfect rule, no confusion, 
only peace, no disorder, only order. And that was to be made possible as he subjected himself, or maybe I should say if he subjected himself to God as his creator, as his Lord. But Adam, we know the story, and his wife Eve ended up subjecting themselves to another and relying on self instead of the sovereign. From the beginning, mankind has proven he is incapable of sustaining self-governance. Incapable of self-governance, that is, apart from their from submission to God. And it has been proven over and over again that apart from submission to God, individuals, families, churches, and societies will fall into disorder and fail. They'll become weak, they'll become dysfunctional, they'll become corrupt, harmful, and they will become evil. And I use that word purposely. God ordained order for all things in nature and for humans for the benefit of all. And order is an essential component of God's creation. God created all things by the working of his mighty powers. God's mighty powers created all things and ordained all things to follow an order that serves him and very importantly serves the benefit everything he created. Disorder, then, is an undoing and disturbance to the natural order and all of its benefits. And, you know, I just want to make a comment kind of off to the side about a word that I just used there, the word natural. I think that is a word that we must use more often in our dialogue today when we see some of the things that are going on around us. Let me give you a for instance. We know that years ago, through the misappropriation of power by governments, they redefined God's definition of marriage. And when we discuss that now, very often what we say about the way marriage used to be is we say, you know, the traditional idea of marriage. Traditionally, it was a man and a woman. I say get rid of that word tradition because tradition too often is something man came up with and we need to substitute natural. That was a natural marriage as opposed to unnatural. And you can think about all the things that are going on right now with the trans movement and all of that ugliness that that brings. We don't want to talk about what was traditionally a boy and traditionally a girl. We want to talk about what was naturally a boy and what is naturally a girl. And so I would just encourage you to watch the language to you. Words matter. They say a lot. But listen, God does not apply power for power's sake. And we don't submit to him simply because he's powerful. We choose to submit to God because he loves and he's graceful and he's merciful and he's good. When God ordains something or someone with a higher power, he intends that power to be a reflection of his character and his attributes. This is because in him is perfection, which is the greatest presentation of order that I can think of. It is the supremely divine order. Earthly higher powers ordained by God must not be anything less or different than the character of the one who ordained it. Whether husband and wife, parent and child, Master and bond servant, the church, human governments, it must begin with submission to the powerful, loving creator God and then fight to represent him. Now, why do I say fight to represent him? Well, let me answer that question with a question. Why does Paul follow his instruction on the order of all these relationships we read about in Ephesians this morning? with a call to put on the whole armor of God and then to pray. Because that's what it takes for this effort to be done. To keep things in order by God's decree and not in order as the world would decree it is a fight. And we need to be fully armored to fight that fight and prayer is the weapon that we wield. 
So once again, let's read verse 1 in both forms. Let every soul be subject to the government authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Then King James, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So, let's ask some questions and give some answers. Who is the subject of this subjection? Well, it's every soul. How do I define every soul? Very simply, every breathing creature. That's every soul. So that's every one. Okay, let's start there. Next question. What does this verse ask of every breathing creature to be subject to? What does that mean, to be subject to? It means to subordinate. It needs, means to be under obedience. It means to submit self unto. Then what does this verse ask every breathing creature to be subject to? It says the governing authorities. It says higher powers. Now the definition of those words are very important. And listen, what does it mean authority? What does it mean power? Well, the first definition, it's a, it's a privilege. It's very important to get that picture. It's a privilege. It also speaks of capacity. Very importantly, it speaks of jurisdiction. And most importantly, and we'll talk much more about this, it speaks of delegated influence. Delegated influence. It's a power given to those in higher power to influence people for God. For God. Not for themselves. Now, this term, also extremely important, does not refer to unlimited power or a license to rule by untethered force or to rule in self-interest. Instead, it is a delegation of authority that is limited. You think about it. Even Jesus operated within delegated limits of authority and was subject to a higher power. In John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. In John 14, 31, Jesus says, But that the word may excuse me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, I do. In John 5, 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son of, can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Let me use a military example. When I was in the military, my rank carried authority and power. And each of those was inherent to my rank. It was an ordained privilege. But I was always subject to higher powers. My authority was limited, and I was required to faithfully represent those that were superior to me. It would have been a violation of my oath and of good order and discipline to exercise power not ordained to my rank and position. And I think that's a great illustration that we can apply to those who sit in offices of higher power. Let's read that first verse again. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. From the King James, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. For there is no authority except from God, meaning granted by his permission and sanctioned by him. Let me go back to my military experience. My authority and power did not reside in me. The authority and power I exercised resided in my rank. 
My subordinates responded were, and were obedient to my rank, despite me. When I responded and was obedient to my superiors, I was responding to a superior rank, not necessarily a superior person. And this is like what we have here. God has ordained positions of higher power. He has appointed positions of authority. And God does not necessarily appoint the specific individuals that fill those positions, although he could and he does. And he could always use any individual for his purposes. But we must ask the question, are those individuals in those positions always subject to God who ordained the authority of their position? Absolutely not. Because we have things involved in all of those people, besides the fact that they're people. They all have free will. They all contend with sin. They all are challenged but to be disobedient. Some and many have a spirit of rebellion. And some are just darn right evil. You know, as we study through this letter to the Romans, we've heard Paul teach explicitly on the believer's freedom from the law of Moses. That liberty was made possible by Jesus, who perfectly fulfilled the requirements of the law. He overcame its penalty of death by submitting himself in perfection, covering us by his blood, marrying his grace with our faith. But with this chapter, and this is very important, Paul wanted believers to understand that they were not so free or at liberty so great in Christ that civil law could be ignored. God appointed civil authorities for all the good that an orderly and respectful society could bring. They were for the benefit of that society to accomplish the things that fallen and sinful people could not. The reason this is so important for believers to understand is because to mix our freedom in Christ with the thought that we're free from all rule could make believers the most disruptive and disorderly people in society. That means where God's ordinances are at work, let me emphasize that, where God's ordinances are at work, believers should be the greatest examples of obedience as a benefit to others and to society at large. But there's a condition there where God's ordinances are at work. Look at verse 2 of our text. Therefore, because of what we read in verse 1, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgments on themselves. Now, with this verse, we're handed the ability to test the spirit of those that occupy positions of authority. Test whether or not they are of God and from God. I believe it's entirely just that we would be judged for resisting the ordinance of God. Ordinances, what's that word mean? It's arrangement, institution, the word order. So what is the test here? Well, the the test is this. Are those in authority and wielding power operating by, for, and within the ordinances of God? If they are, then my resistance to them is resistance to God, and judgment is mine. But if they are not wielding power and operating by, for, and within the ordinance of God, then I am only resisting man and not God. You know, there's so many examples I could have used this morning of where godly people in Scripture stood up against the power of men. One that's very familiar comes from Acts chapter 5. It says, when when they had brought the disciples, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, a good question would be, are there other ways we can identify rulers that are in line with the ordinance of God and operate justly? Well, there is. Look at the 
First part of the next verse, verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Civil authorities are not a source of fear for people of good behavior and orderly conduct, but instead for those who do evil. I'd say that that test presents a pretty clear standard, pretty clear way to prove things. It's easily observed. It's clearly defined. And now let's add the second part of that verse. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. So what's the test here? When you do good, which I would define as doing what is godly and just, do you receive praise from those in authority? And are you without fear of reprisal for doing good and just things? And then the next verse as well adds to our ability to test the spirit. Verse 4, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now here we see God's wonderfully perfect plan for human government. Those who rule would serve the people to bring about good and to benefit societies. And if evil is done in society, there would be need of fear by the perpetrators because the authorities have the ordained power to punish the ones who practice evil. Then look at verse 5, and this is the second time we hear, therefore, meaning because of what was just said. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So one must be subjective to civil authorities not only to escape the punishment that comes with wrongdoing, but also as a matter of principle, knowing what is right before God and for the sake of your conscience. And then the last two verses, but nowhere near the end of this message, verse 6 and 7, for because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. So the emphasis there is the same. God, godly and just authorities are owed and deserved what is due them. So if I was to summarize all seven of these verses, simply, how might I do it? Well, I'm going to use two verses. One comes from 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 3. And there it says, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke and said, he who rules over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. And then from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse four, it says, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Righteous and upright is he. So should be those God places over others in positions of authority and power. So I would ask this. Can we leave this teaching without applying the test to our own circumstances? I would say no. And so here's the test. And you can answer to yourself as we go through. Are our rulers, and I'm talking about our situation today, are our rulers a terror to evildoers? Are we unafraid of our authorities? When we do good, do we have praise from the rulers? Are our rulers God's ministers for good? When citizens do evil, are they afraid? Of the authorities? In dealing with evil, do the authorities bear the sword? Can we, with a clear conscience, claim that our rulers are God's ministers? Are they avengers executing wrath on him who practices evil? The answer is a clear, emphatic no to every single one of those standards. The majority of our government today, especially at the very top, the ones who sit 
inside that circle called DC. Do not pass the test. Are there some good men and women amongst them? Absolutely. But even some of those I've noticed have failed lately. The answer is a clear and emphatic no to every single one of those standards. So how do we answer that very sad and ugly truth? Well, I'll give you one example I believe answers that question. This is from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 14 and 15. There, it says, Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in those land, whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, some of the parts of those two verses may seem kind of weird because we're dealing with the gods that served on the other side of the river that the Egyptians worshipped. And I will tell you, yes, we are. Not us, them. Those that, can't, that we can't enter yes on their behalf of any of those questions do serve other gods. I mean, you hear it as we talk to one another. Man, I mean, I just can't believe it's gone this far. It's like, it's like demonic. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are bowing down and serving gods other than the God of heaven. And so we have to choose this day whom we will serve. And the word's pretty emphatic, emphatic in giving us the right answer to that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So, because of the wrath of God and for my conscience' sake, I must choose wisely whether or not I will submit to the authorities and powers that rule us today. I should not submit to their authority where and when it is in conflict with God and his word. I should not submit to their authority where it does not line up with the guidelines of these verses that we've studied this morning. But as soon as we have authorities and powers that represent what God has ordained, well, then we must submit fully. But only then, and not until then, Because we're told that ultimately the government will be upon Jesus' shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Prince of Order. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. If we know that he will be that today, or someday, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then why would we wait to serve him and serve him alone until that day? He's the same today. We serve him today. He becomes our priority. He becomes the center of our allegiance and our loyalty. So one more time, our opening verse, and I'm only going to read it in one form this time. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, we discussed how this authority spoken of here is both limited and delegated. And when you consider that in regards to the United States of America and its original formation as a constitutional republic, becomes quite profound. You know, the other thing that's really profound is that if you line up all the talking heads on TV that call themselves newscasters, and you line up all the government people that speak like them because they're all cutting their talking points from the same source, and they keep telling you how dangerous whatever they're talking about is for democracy. This is not a democracy. Just let, you just need to know that. That's a lie. We were formed as a constitutional republic, which is way different. But they're running it like a democracy. So when you 
think about the fact that the authority being spoken is both limited and delegated, and you think about how our country was formed, that it becomes, as I said, quite profound. God may have instituted civil government, but he never dictates what form that government must take, other than being godly and for the benefit of all. As a constitutional republic, the United States has, a, as part of its foundation, both the concept of being limited and being delegated. So the form of our own government represents exactly what God dictated. Because our founding fathers, the framers, although we can argue how godly they were, they were at least deists. They believed God to be true, even if they weren't Christians. And among the signers, there was like 34 pastors, and I'm not saying that makes them anything special. But there was a lot of God in the room. And you can go through the, through the documents and you can find them at least paraphrasing much of Scripture. Delegated powers are government powers specifically outlined in the U.S. Constitution. The term delegated powers refers to the authorities granted to the United States Congress in the U.S. Constitution. An important thing to note regarding how enumerated powers are established is that the Constitution does not, listen, outline what the government cannot do, but what it can do. That means anything not specifically outlined in the Constitution as a power that is bestowed upon Congress is not something Congress has the authority to do. See, I think it's important we understand the original intent. Because if we don't understand the original intent, then we don't know when they're getting away with, the, with their lies and with their evil. So let me read that again. Anything not specifically outlined in the Constitution is a power that is bestowed upon Congress is not something Congress has the authority to do. When I was thinking about this, I remembered a video, and I don't even want to speak his name here, but I'm going to, a vi- an old video of B- Barack Obama. I think it may have been why he was a senator and not even the president. And he disparaged the Constitution. And he disparaged the Constitution as merely a charter of negative liberties. And this is what he said. He said, the Constitution says what the states can't do to you, says what the federal government can't do to you, but doesn't say what the federal government or state government must do on your behalf. That is an absolute 180 out lie. He totally twisted the truth. He totally said it backwards. Reminds me of someone who twists the scripture from the beginning as a liar and the father of lies. But we need to know the truth so we can recognize the lie. Just like we need to understand as we hopefully come to this morning what those seven verses mean for us as believers so that we don't blindly follow authority because they are authority. That we test them as we've seen the test this morning. And if they don't stand up to the test, then we have a choice to make. The framers of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence foresaw the likelihood that authorities and powers would forget or deny their divinely ordained positions. After all, the Founding Fathers were experiencing the tyranny that comes from such disobedience. And it's interesting because when you go back and review the tyranny they were under, it was nothing like what we're getting. The tyranny of King George was nothing compared to what we're getting. They knew the word of God proclaimed that it is God who removes kings and raises kings up. Now, in the Declaration of Independence from July 4th, 1776, and here we're only weeks away. Actually, today's the 4th, isn't it? Good reminder. But listen to what they wrote. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, 
liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All of the leadership was for one purpose. All the power and authority was to bring a society into a position of being benefited. That to, sec- that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. There's the delegated power. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect the safety and happiness of the public. Prudence, indeed, will dictate the governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown, listen, this is so telling of where we're at today. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. That's what we see right now. The public is a deer in the headlights doing nothing because it hasn't gotten so bad that they feel they must do something. And I can tell you when that day comes, it'll be too late. But listen, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object invinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their our right It is there our duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Now, I don't like reading things like that because it'd be very easy for someone to look at me and go, well, you going to lead it? And I know there's a lot of people that sit around and wonder how that could ever start and who would lead it. But all I know is these extremely educated and wise men knew what could come. And they made a way to change it. Now, this isn't necessarily a call to arms, although it could be because it was back then. Because the weapons that we first fight with are not carnal, but spiritual. And as believers, that's the best and most important thing we can do. Because we could get a movement going to take up arms. And like I said, I'm not sure that it won't come to that. But as believers, we are armed with something that non-believers don't have. And we have weapons that are not carnal. And God's pretty explicit about what it's going to take, if it could happen at all, to get things back on track. And I don't know if that's his plan, because I don't know how late the hour is. And many of you know the verse I'm going to go to. Second Chronicles 7.14. And there God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, I never like using that verse unless I put it in context. Because we pull that out and it's very important to hear the verse before it and the verse after it. So let me read the verse before it the verse I just read, and the verse after it. Because if you want to see how dear and near this should be to us right now, it's right here. Beginning in verse 13, God says, When I shut up heaven, and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Notice there's a condition. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And then the next verse, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. So we have weapons to fight with. And right now I would say we need to start with the ones that are not carnal. I want to give one last military example. 
When I was in uniform, it was my duty to carry out the orders of my superiors. And it was my duty to carry out the original orders of my superiors unless relieved by a competent authority. And it was my duty to carry out the orders of my superiors as long as those orders were lawful. If I was not being relieved of my duties by competent authorities, or the orders I received were not lawful, I was duty-bound to resist. Respectfully, but duty-bound to resist. So I would ask us this, as believers, what orders have we received from the higher power? Well, the orders that we've received is this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And then he says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I know that these orders here that I just read are both lawful and absolutely given by competent authority. And why do I know that? Because Jesus went on to say, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So we bow the knee to the one who is all powerful. We bow our knee to him first. And then when we look at men and women, we have to question whether they've bowed or not. That needs to be the criteria of our testing. I don't know of any power or authority that's more competent. And I don't know of any power that's strong enough to relieve me of those orders. There is none. Because he's been given all power. Amen. Church has become weak only because it's allowed itself to become weak. I don't believe God ever intended us to be weak. I think we become soft because we let ourselves become soft. I don't, I see, when I look at the little, when I look at the Lord, I, I, I know his gentle ways. I know his loving ways. I know that he'll appear as the lamb who was slain. The lamb seems to give us this, this feeling of, about his, his gentleness. But he's a warrior king. He is a warrior king. And I think we need to appeal to that strength. And we know that that's offensive because I'd probably be accused of toxic masculinity if I said that too many places. But I don't think masculinity in the church is toxic enough. I use that word loosely. But I think we need to be as powerful and as willing as the king we serve. So, Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the encouragement in it, Lord, and I hope the clarity that we received this morning to be able to stand strong. Lord, to always look for your presence and your power, to always be able to test the spirit of what we see to see if it's of you and by you and for you. Lord, I just ask you to make us wise. And Lord, you would help us to to walk this earth as you did with strength and yet with love. To be able to speak truth into matters and yet be able to speak them with grace, with mercy. Lord, we need your strength in these days. So, Lord, now we come to you as your body, Lord, with our prayers and our supplications and our petitions, Lord, and our praises. We just turn over this time for that. Thank you, Lord.